Star Citizen News, you've come to the right place. Engines on, let's go. Welcome back again everyone to episode 20 of The Hall of Truth for the week of 17, February 2014. We've got information overload on the show this week. Prepare yourselves, let's do the website recap. Starting off the week with one of my favorite types of updates, a lore update. This time it's Galactic Guide for Davian. Davian is known as the site where the first contact between humans and the Banu was made. Featuring an orange Type K main sequence star, Davian was originally considered nothing special until a man named Vernon Tarr opened fire on a ship he believed was trying to jump his claim. The ship turned out to be a Banu merchantman that later turned out to be a fugitive fleeing from their own civilization. No one was killed and things ended up working out for the best as a treaty was drawn up between the two races. Davian exploded with activity, suddenly everyone had to have a claim here and it became the port of trade between the Banu and humans. Davian too became one of the more populated human worlds in the galaxy. In another continuation of a lore storyline about the Xi'an opening service stations on human planets, the first of such has opened in the Ellis system. This is the first time a completely Xi'an corporation has been allowed to open a business on a human planet. CTR stations provide fuel and repair services and is one of the most trusted providers within the Xi'an territories. They also offered repairs to human ships, making them a favored stop for humans traveling through Xi'an space. There are political observations to be made and some people are against this being allowed. They think that the government is just making money off of these contracts with alien companies while shafting the local human population. This station was built and staffed exclusively by Xi'an, providing no job opportunities for humans at all. An attempt has been made to counteract this by implementing a training program for human employees to teach them the common practices of the Xi'an for a job like this. As you can see, CIG is doing a good job of paralleling these in-lore issues with real life issues that we've been dealing with for years in our own lives. There was a Van Duel update gallery released this week with 17 pictures to entice you and keep you wanting more. There are a lot of picture updates with the scythe in this group of photos as well as a Van Duel bomber and a harvester. One thing to note is the seating position in the scythe. Apparently it's going to be a little tough for a human to fly one of these things considering the size of the Van Duel and the awkwardness of the ride. One of the CIG devs mentioned briefly that some things may have to be changed slightly considering humans can and will be flying these ships. If you're new to Star Citizen lore, the Van Duel are the main bad guy or protagonist of the galaxy. We don't know a lot yet, but we do know that there is a Van Duel territory, but we don't know where their homeworld is or exactly what they're after. We do know that they tend to be after our resources more so than just blasting us out of the sky. Another interesting note is that all Vanduul seem to operate in hordes, sort of like a tribal system, and may war amongst each other as well. Oh yeah, they're also like 8 feet tall armored beast creatures, so that's kind of scary. So there was a massive update to the aforementioned scythe, and we got a video exhibiting the redesign with physical base rendering, or PBR. For some reason when I look at this ship, I imagine a race of warring hawk-like people flying it. From the top, it kind of looks like a massive bird wing on one side with an arm holding a gun on the other. The ship looks extremely badass, but it also looks extremely fragile with those completely exposed engines in the back. One little tidbit of information is that it was revealed this week by lead designer Rob Irving that we will be fighting AI-controlled enemy scythes in the first iteration of the dogfighting module. Exciting. Dateline Sesson Part 3 is here. I think this is probably my favorite lore series thus far by the team. I know a lot of other people are really enjoying it as well. If you haven't read these yet, please do yourself a favor and check them out. Dateline Sesson follows the tale of a behind the lines criminal journalist named Ula Yadav who's trying to dig up the dirt on underhanded dealings by big corporations in the verse. After the thrilling events of last week's discoveries, find out this week what happens in the aftermath. Government officials get involved? Is Haddix alive? What's going on here? Read it and find out. I've had a lot of requests to do a lore recap show separate from the whole truth, and of course, time is always an issue for me there. I would like your feedback though. If you would like me to do dramatic lore readings as a series for the community, please let me know in the comments below. If there's enough response to it, maybe I can find the time to get them done. The next great Starship Episode 3 is over, and we're down to the final 15, and the wildcard vote ended on the website yesterday. 
The next episode will begin the final battle of all 16 teams to see who will win the $30,000 and the chance to design the mercenary gunship for the final game. I covered the first episode of TNGS and Whole Truth episode 18 and intended to make separate videos to recap the rest of the series considering the actual show is over 40 minutes long. I just ran out of time this last week and got a bit overwhelmed by work. I'm still going to make these videos and release them even if they are a bit late as well as attempt to cover future episodes. In the meantime, if you want to catch up, you can watch the full episodes on CIG's website. As always, links below the video in the info section. Let's find out what happened on Wingman's Hangar this week. With a new sound stage and a better format, Wingman's Hangar is looking and sounding better than ever. A lot more information and a lot less fluff seems to be the new goal, but the episode still weighed in at 34 minutes long. I gotta say though that I felt like there was a lot more intelligent conversation going on in the show and a lot less goofiness. I think this is a good place for Wingman's Hangar. We still have the team's character and personality coming through, but it's not overwhelming the rest of the content. It's a very good balance. Great job to everyone working on that show. I know how tough it is. It's come a long way in a year, and I really appreciate the effort you guys put into it. In this episode of Wingman's Hangar, we get an interview with Chris Olivier, who seemed to have lost at least one article of clothing on the way to the show. Chris goes into more detail about the Scythe redesign and PBR and also states that the ship design is trying to emulate the Vandal characters with a biomechanical look and feel. You can definitely see that in the Scythe. We also got a new forum MVP. This week it goes to Cryo for his thread titled, If your gunship was an animal, what kind of animal would it be? Mine would be a hornet and it will blow all of your puny little animal ships to bits. I honestly don't understand why this one forum MVP, but maybe that's just my logical brain not letting me have any fun again. Thanks a lot, brain. The fan focus this week was for Phil, who was not linked in any place in the video or the info section that I could find, so I dug up the forum post for you guys so you can see his process. Phil designed and printed the Cutlass on a 3D printer, and it is amazing. It looks like it was time consuming, but well worth it. Great job, Phil, for doing that and showing us the process. I would pay money for one of those if that was legal. I vote for an Avenger next time. It seems like it would be a lot easier to print than the Cutlass. Let's find out what Rob Irving had to say this week in forum feedback. Will organizations in the Persistent Universe contribute to the day-to-day -day running of the universe, or are they just a group for players to join? Rob said, organizations by nature are collections of players and players can affect the universe in little ways and sometimes in larger ways. As far as the organizations, you'll have some impact on individual systems by blockading them. See, I thought previously they said that their goal was to not allow people to completely take over systems, but it seems like blockading systems is still in. What is the latest on instancing and how will it impact the game? Is the cap ship based or player based and how big will it be? Rob said, we don't know the actual cap size yet, it will be a combination of players and ships that affect the cap. The players on an Idris won't count in the same way as players in Hornets. They have the same communication with the server, but they don't have the same movement impact as all the Hornets flying around. There's a lot that we have to figure out as we go. What's the status of the Voyager Direct Store revamp? Rob said the plan is to release the Voyager Direct revamp shortly after the dogfighting module. When is the dogfighting module coming out? Ooh. Big reveal here. Rob said, the plan is we are going to do an unveiling of the dogfighting module at PAX East. If all goes as planned, we will release it to the public shortly after that reveal. There's a lot of moving parts. We're just bringing on the universe servers this week, so it's gonna take a lot of iterations to get that running properly. There you have it folks, the DFM is being revealed at PAX East and it's coming to the players shortly after. If you're curious, PAX East happens April the 11th through the 13th. If you log off on a friend's constellation and then he logs out of the game before you come back, where will you be when you log in? Rob said, if you physically put your character on a ship as opposed to taking over an AI gunner, you are signing up for the entire ride. If you log out prior to your friends logging out, you should expect to come back on that ship. If that ship is in space, we may let you fly the ship if your friend has given you those permissions, or you may end up back on the planet you started on. If I'm piloting a multi-crewed ship and I get disconnected and AI takes over, do I retain control and return to the hangar, or can a friend take control from the AI and continue the mission? Rob said, one of the things we talked about is giving your friend permission to fly. If you disconnect and are flying the ship, the AI will take over control of the ship and try to take it to its destination. If a friend is on board who has permission to fly, then that friend can replace that AI pilot. 
How will discovery of jump points be handled? Once it's discovered, is it automatically uploaded for the verse to use, or will we be able to share it with organization members first, then upload it when we get back to civilized space? Rob said, you can hold that information for yourself or friends, and when you are ready, upload it to the universe. Then Eric asked, what happens if you give the clan that information and me, being a clan member, decides that I want to name that jump point after me? Rob says if someone else finds it while you're keeping the info to yourself, that person will end up getting to name that jump point. Wow, risk versus reward here. Keep it for the benefit of your small group and risk losing the credit for finding it, or just go ahead and upload it immediately and leave your mark on the universe forever. Will there be medical services that players will have the opportunity to provide? Could we turn a ship into a mobile hospital? Rob said we do have mechanics around rescuing players from combat and helping them heal. There may be a situation where if you manage to drag a friend out of a fight who is seriously wounded, you may be able to keep them from dying. What we don't know is what ships will be medical ships. On a side note here, we do know that an upcoming ship, the Anvil Karak, is a self-sufficient ship made for long duration flight that features crew medical facilities and repair facilities. Could this end up being a go-to ship for search and rescue ops? It sounds pretty exciting to me. We're already planning a search and rescue division within our organization for just that. In the DFM, will we be able to use power management systems to control where we send power? Rob said yes, we're bringing those systems online. We won't have the full system online in the first iteration because capital ship power systems are very complicated, but we will have some form of that. You will be able to move power from engines to shields and weapons. We've seen spaceships and the buggy, but will there be other types of vehicles and machinery in the game? Rob says yes, we're already getting concept art done for a cargo sled and maybe even some EVA mining equipment. We also promised some time ago that there would be a repair bot. Wait a second, did he say EVA? So people are going to be able to do mining from outside their ships? I don't think there's any way I'll be able to resist shooting at those people while they're floating around asteroids. Will the owners of the Scythe be able to fly them as soon as the dogfighting module is released? Rob said the Scythe is initially planned to be an AI opponent in the DFM. There are a lot of systems that need to come online for it to be fully playable like the cockpit, HUD, and animations. As it comes online, we will bring it in when it's ready. That's it for forum feedback with Rob and Eric. Let's recap 10 for the chairman. All of these questions are answered by Chris Roberts himself. Command and control, radar, scanning, and detection have been mentioned as parts of the game. Will a craft like the Hornet Tracker be able to relay its gathered info to a CNC ship? Chris says yes, the Tracker has a much bigger and more powerful radar array and should be able to pump info to another ship. You could have a Hornet Tracker relay its information to a bigger ship. Capital ships are going to be revealed in the near future. What happens when I fly to a Banu world? Chris said there will definitely be space ports. Not the entire Banu area will be mapped out, although down the road it probably will be. They have different architecture. We're designing the Xi'an right now, and we're starting to do that kind of stuff on the Banu. We'll be showing you some Xi'an stuff pretty soon. Do Class 4 turrets come as manned and or remote controlled? Chris said, a Class 4 turret is a bigger remotely controlled turret. It is not a manned turret. Class 5 and above are manned. A Class 4 turret is a weapon mount that has either a bigger gun or power points for two smaller guns like the ball turret and the canard turret on the Hornet. A Class 2 mount is a small turret that can only fit one smaller gun on it like the wing gatlings on the Hornet. A Class 1 is a fixed mount for a gun. We have a bigger setting that goes up to Class 10 for capital ships. Class 10? That's insane. Will I be able to make some credits with a cruise line or will the public transportation system make such services obsolete? Chris said, we're looking for ways that people can run their own businesses in game. We'd like to find a way that people can do transport. There will be big cruise liners and the public transportation system we already mentioned. How can a person who only has two or three hours a week hope to get a level of enjoyment out of Star Citizen when the competition plays 10 to 20 hours a week? Chris basically said, I'm designing the game so there are different things you can do. It depends on what you want to do and what your definition of winning is. I definitely don't think that you won't be having fun with only two to three hours a week. Will Squadron 42 and Star Citizen have SMAA, or Enhanced Subpixel Morphological Anti-Aliasing, in the CryEngine? Chris said, I believe that we support pretty much all anti-aliasing setups. We have four dedicated graphics engineers and we're looking to hire another two to three. The goal is to have more graphics engineers on Star Citizen than even Crytek has. 
Will there be a way to park and leave fighters in the fighter bay of the Idris? Chris said yes, the Idris is designed to have a complement of ships on it. In Squadron 42, it has an active complement of two ships, so in the military, it has two Hornets with a backup Hornet. If you have two Hornets, you will definitely be able to have them in your Idris. Big ships, small ships, and rooms will all have their own inventories, and you can move your ships from your hangar inventory to the Idris inventory. When will the Christmas decorations come down? Chris said, we're planning to do a house cleaning hangar update in the next week or so, and one of the things in the update is bringing the decorations down. Will there be graphics updates over time? Chris said, the long-term plan is that Star Citizen is never going to stop being developed. We will continue to add content and functionality and have a lot of long-term plans for adding more systems to the game. That does it for the Q&A. Let's see what's up in other news. This week I thought I would run through a few tidbits of information I scrounged up from the CIG devs that post in their respective forums on the website. The first one is from CIG Huntokar. The question asked was whether or not we'll be able to stand up and walk around inside the spaces in our ships in the dogfighting module when it first releases. CIG Huntakar responded with, We do have a solution for interior spaces on moving ships. I'm not sure if it's been implemented yet, but the Hornet has no interior space anyway, so it doesn't matter for dogfighting module version 1. I guess that means version 1 of the dogfighting module will only have flyable Hornets. Interesting and a bit disappointing. I know a lot of people have been looking for a definite confirmation on whether or not we'll be able to fly different ships at the start of the DFM. This seems to pretty much confirm that we won't. Another gem from CIG Huntakar shows some funny stuff that used to happen to the pilot of a ship when it crashed. Painful. I also found a lot of good information on how the AI characters function in the game. Here's a few bits and bobs. The AI will respond to their individual characteristics, ship loadouts, and the current state of their ship, so I'm sure people will be able to get a good understanding of tactics to help beat different types of AI. Currently the AI uses radar to help perceive and then target certain ships. If you partially damage the radar or use a chaff countermeasure, for example, the AI would get broken or incorrect information from the radar. In these scenarios, AI may have other means of tracking you, like standard view or comms but they would certainly be hindered and you could gain the upper hand. Additionally, if you set your loadout to something stealthy, the AI radar would reflect this so that you're able to hide and ambush them. It's starting to sound like the AI in the game is going to be extremely fleshed out. It's good to hear that they're working really hard on that aspect of the game. Chris Roberts has always said that his goal is to make the AI good enough that it's very difficult to tell if it's an actual player or not. One last little bit of information on the organization module. Someone asked a question about being able to hide rank stars and titles as a setting to keep certain information private for the organization only. Ben Lesnick responded on the forums by saying that we will have that option and the goal is to allow orgs to hide as much of their content as possible for obvious reasons. The org system is one of my favorite things about this game and so far I'm always looking forward to every new update. Having a fleshed out system for our organizations means a lot more control over how we all play the game together, and that's what's really important. Let's do the r slash star citizen post of the week. This week it goes to Byronic for his video Star Citizen in 6 minutes. This is a video attempting to explain the basics of what Star Citizen is in a short, coherent way to help first timers get on board. Great video Byronic, and thanks for putting in the effort and helping out the community. That's what it's all about guys, the community. That about does it for this week's episode. Thanks again for all of your support. I would not be doing this if it wasn't for you guys. Until next Monday, walk softly, carry a big stick. Goodbye.